Welcome, everybody, to Ramdas Here and Now. I'm Raghu Marcus, and this is another in our episodes, Ramdas and our Puja side chats, or we call them just Puja chats, meaning that he, uh, people that visit him in Maui, uh, many of them are teachers in their own right or personalities of some note, shall we say? And uh, so Ramdas, as I s- mentioned in the last episode, uh, which uh, he did a chat with Lama Surya Das, uh, he does these in the midst of his living room, uh, where there's a beautiful altar with so many uh, of the greatest saints of the last century, as well as people that uh, Ramdas always talks about putting on his puja, people that he has trouble with in terms of their, what he calls, quote-unquote, rotten incarnations. George Bush, George W., was one of those people. I think he's got John Boehner up there right now, but he might have to put Ted Cruz there, too. I'm not sure. Uh, Not to get uh, too intimate (laughs) with... Those people that Ramdas has, a, I have a lot more personally, folks. I'll have to tell you that I'd have a, I'd have to have a whole, large puja, uh, a much larger puja than I have now, to contain some of the characters that I'd like more to relate with as souls and understand that they really truly are, uh, like all of us, as His Holiness says, we all just want the Dalai Lama, we just want happiness, and so does Ted in this instance. I, I'm. Why I'm focusing on him, I'm not quite sure. Um, This particular chat is with Mickey Lemley. And many of you would probably know who Mickey is due to the film that he made with Ram Dass called Fierce Grace, which is a very well-known film. Anybody who's out there that has not seen this film, I think that you, you would enjoy it. Uh, immensely. It is a a fabulous portrait of what happened after Ramdas had that almost life expiration through a stroke in 1997, I think, 7, 8, 7. Uh, and how he, um, what happened to him is his uh, loss of faith, his regaining of that faith, his uh, being able to recognize what the grace was amidst this tragic, tragic event in his life where he lost the power to speak, which was his greatest power, his greatest city, was, of course, what he'd been doing for decades, uh, being able to transform through his uh, talks. And uh, so it's it's an incredible... A really fascinating and wonderful movie. It has it's so many uh, moments that are just uh, so moving, really. Mickey did a, a wonderful job. Mickey's also done, um, Mickey is a doc filmmaker, and he's also done a uh, wonderful documentary with His Holiness, the Dalai Lama, from many years ago, and he's working on a new piece with His Holiness uh, as we speak. And so I thought it would be uh, special to have... Uh, uh, just to play this, uh, not all of it, I think a good part of it we're going to play, this talk with uh, Mickey and uh, Ram Dass. And uh, they have quite a, a beautiful relationship, so I thought everybody would enjoy this. Uh, I also, uh, before we play this, I do want to again uh, thank everybody for their support for Ram Dass's foundation, Love Serve Remember Foundation. And... Um, allowing us to continue to share everything we do share through ramdas.org and through retreats. Um, And just to let you know, uh, which will be announced uh, this week, but we're going to announce it first right here and right now. And that's that uh, for the April retreat, which is Ramdas, Krishna Das, Roshi Joan Halifax, and others, um, on May 1, 2, and 3, we are going to live stream a couple of sessions a day uh, from Maui. And uh, it's a wonderful opportunity to participate. Just go to ramdas.org. You'll see 
uh, you'll be able to navigate. There'll be big banners up there uh, telling you what to do. You got to sign up, and it's all free. And uh, it's a great opportunity to to uh, to be with uh, these fabulous teachers. So, uh, other than that, uh, again, keep keep up the support. It it allows us to do just these kinds of things, uh, these workshops and online retreats and. Uh, webcasts and everything that Ramdas does and and all of the other people that we have uh teaching with him at uh, different times and now Ramdas here and now another puja chat with Mickey Lemley well i use storytelling um in spiritual teaching because two one is um as stories um break through into heart spaces and also spiritual matters are hard to talk about because they're not um you can't get the concepts across and uh stories will sort of knock on the door of spirit well i i find like when i'm interviewing some some great being like ramdas or the dalai lama people who've spent their lives thinking about big thoughts, um, that very often you'll hear something, like a, a, a sentence, and you'll think, oh, God, that sums it up perfectly. That is so, that, that truth, I want to preserve it. So you, you, you write it out, you, and then you think, no. And you go to a friend that does calligraphy, and you have them do calligraphy, and, and you put it on your refrigerator so that it's the first thing you think every day. That's what you, you say to yourself. I want to think this thought, first thought, every day. And within a day or two, you're just going to get the milk for your coffee. You stop reading it. You stop thinking it. And it's some great truth. It's like, um, you know, everything is everything. Or you know, it, it's, it's all love. Or it's all one. Or, and, and I find that when, when, when I'm interviewing somebody and they say something that's great like that, I always get them to root it in personal experience so that it has some weight. So when the Dalai Lama would say something like that, I'd say, and Your Holiness, when did, when did that first occur to you in your life? Tell me the story about how you came to that. And then it has, it has emotional uh, and, and experiential, experiential weight. Because what I've found is that, that people can argue with any intellectual idea. So if you say it's all one, then th there's an argument that, well, no, it's really the many. And, and that's, that debate's been yeah. going on for a long time. But if somebody says, I was walking on the beach, and when I saw the sun setting, I had this experience that it was really all one, you can't argue with that. You can't argue with them and say, no, you didn't feel that. Because no. it's experience. You can argue with ideas, but you can't argue with experience. And for me, personally, that's how I retain things. I retain things through stories rather than abstract concepts. Um, if it's wrapped in this, if the, if, the, if the concept is somehow wrapped in a story, uh, I, I remember it. And uh, I remember it forever. I mean, I remember stories that people told me when I was a child. Yeah. Ver verbatim. You know, they have that kind of weight. Yeah, that's right. That's right. You know, um, stories like Terry Dobson's story. Um, gee, I don't remember it one. I'm, I should remember it. It's so vivid. Terry was a... Um, uh, what, what, a keto student. A keto student. And uh, he was on a train, in a, 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 a Japanese train, 
and the train stopped at a station and the um, onto the train came a drunk and he was uh, acting out and he, he was he kicked a, uh, an old woman and uh, Terry was um, he stood up and he, feel, he, he was a martial arts person and he was going to take this guy uh, down and the 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 drunk turned around and looked at Terry and said, oh, uh, a foreigner, and they, he's, he's, they're going to fight. And before the fight began, there was a voice uh, in the car, and the voice said, um, uh, An old man, an old man, and he said, "Hey, yeah, that, that was it. That was the yeah. <laughs> hey, hey, hey." And they both turned around at this, and, and the old man sitting, grinning at both of them, and. Um, the old man said to the drunk, um, what you been drinking? And the drunk said, I've been drinking sake. And the old man says, you know, I, me and my wife, we drink sake every night. We go out and we sit in front of our persimmon tree We've been, those persimmons are wonderful. Do you like persimmons? And the drunk is, he doesn't understand, but. So the drunk says, uh, yeah. And they started persimmon stories. And uh, Terry is all ready to fight. And at the next stop, Terry gets off the train and he looks at, looks at the people. And the drunk is, is sitting next to the old man. And the drunk ha has his head down on the on the lap of the old man and the old man has his hand on the man, the trunk and they are talking in this very intimate terms and it was Terry said uh, he said that was that was that was Aikido. That was Aikido. That man did Aikido. And it was just, it, it, it's all, you're all ready to the fight, but the just cut through, cut through. And I remember that story. Just, just remember that story. Could I? I look. I look. I look for the. I want to start. Hey. 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 And and you, you know, I first heard the story when you you read it in one of your workshops. Yeah. Years ago, and I've heard it. Heard, heard you tell it a few times since always beautifully. And the thing is, an Aikido teacher could say to a class, the essence of Aikido is avoiding conflict and taking the energy of the aggressor 
and using it to to disarm them and to avoid conflict so you can hear that as an abstract idea yeah but when you hear the story yeah. you remember it forever and yeah. it, it, because it, 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 it that's just the way I think we're wired up as a, as a species for stories. Yeah. You know, we really are. It's like, you know, with, with every child that's ever been, it's like, Daddy, Mommy, tell me a story. And, you know, and you, it starts once upon a time. Yeah. And, and all of a sudden, they get quiet. And I, I used to do that with my son. He'd say, he, every night before he'd go to bed, I'd say, you know, he'd say, Daddy, tell me a story. And I'd say, well, what do you want to hear about? And he would tell me. And I'd say, okay. And it, they all started the same way. Once upon a time, long, long ago, back in the days when dogs could talk. <laughs> <laughs> so, <clears throat> <laughs> even if it was a story about something that happened the week before, he said, yeah. Yeah, it was only last week. <laughs> but we all love stories. I mean, I, you know, uh, I, I had the privilege of making a movie about Sir Lawrence Vanderpost, who was also a, a, a great, great, great storyteller. And I, I'm really drawn in my movie subjects yeah. to great storytellers, your, yourself as a prime example. And um, uh, he was in a prison, Japanese prisoner of war camp for three and a half years. And he said that one of the things that kept everybody's morale up and kept people alive, literally, was the fact that he would tell stories every night in like like um, serials on television that he'd leave them with a cliffhanger and then they'd have to come back the next night to hear what happened next. Uh-huh. And he, he wove these amazing stories for months at a time. And 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 I interviewed one guy who, who was in the camp with Lawrence and he said he used to just change his place in line when they went to wash up because he just wanted to be next to him in case th- some story came out <laughs> while they were while they were washing their dishes or whatever yeah can we can we stop for one second i just want to fix this oh. i'm think his uh, you're not going down that far right No, I'll just turn it off, turn it off. And then I'll throw it over there. I, 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 I really? Yeah. Well, um, I like Maharaji stories because I think I can convey, I can convey Maharaji in, in just a quick story, but he just to convey the 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 miracle stuff like um um he was in Haldwani and he said and he said um he sat down with a group and then he got up and he says i want to go and they said well you don't or we well, can't you didn't he didn't, didn't tell us. Anything. I want to go, and he says, I, "Get it, get the cab." And and they got the cab, and the and he says, "We're going to uh, uh, this other little place." And um, uh, they got there, and. Everybody is so quiet and sleepy. And he making noise and he, he people came and they all stood around. 
And he said, where, where are they? Where are they? And he said, nobody can threaten God. And he said, um, nobody can threaten God. Would you, they're in something, uh, I think it's a, a, uh, an old shack. And everybody said, no, we, we don't have anybody on the, and they, they find, hey, we, uh, the old something shack, somebody else. Let's, Marge, go to the shack and bring me whoever's there. And there was, and they knocked, and the old, old man said, leave us alone. And Maharaj, he said, bring them here. And it was, an old couple from southern India, and uh, um, they were starving to death. They came, they were, uh, they were a pilgrimage, and uh, coming north into the mountains, and. Um, uh, uh, their money and bags were stolen, and they were they, the, and here the man said, "I've done puja and and prayed to God, but look at he he treats us, he treats us and." We are going to starve to death. And Maharaji, bring food, bring food. Eat, you eat. You can't threaten God. There, eat. And then here, his 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 money for the trip back. And the guy said, we've, we've saved for this uh, pilgrimage. And um, uh, our children are old enough so that they can run the business. Finally, and now we've, we've gone on this pilgrimage and he's crying and and just saying, Maharaj, you say, you can't threaten God. God takes care. God, you may forget God, but God, God takes care of you. Just hearing that story, he gets up in another town. You know, he's... Uh, that's good. So, so how do you explain that, Ramdas? How, how do you, do you have you ever tried to, or do you just accept it? Like, I think Maharaji? I think Maharaji is um, when people are in trouble. There's a certain quality about them that uh, that Maharaji senses. Some of his devotees, this is always when somebody is in trouble. And, um, and I, I, like, I'm, uh, I have Maharaji with me all the time, but I've never had him. I've never been in trouble that way. And so I've never 
had him swoop out from, you know, I just give it, he's, a, he's naturally here. So, so even after the stroke, you find yourself lying on the floor, unable to move, and you don't think you're in trouble? <laughs> well, I, I was, did have, uh, <laughs> what, are you a minding <laughs> No, I'm just asking. He, you didn't feel. <laughs> you, did you feel his presence then? I did. I I just because I was lying on the floor, by the bed. There was no trouble here. There. I mean, I was comfortable, and, and it was not a unique experience for you. No, because <laughs> because because I uh, I've laid on many floors. You know, when you when you're a stroke, you can't get up from the floor. So I couldn't get up, to, and I had a ring of the bell or something like that. So that was, uh, you know, it was a bad situation, but it wasn't, you know, ah, you know. I think. Um, well, let's see. I I want to. No, I was laughing. You were laughing. I was laughing with Maharaji. <laughs> so he was there, but yeah, it was it yeah. was funny. Yeah. <laughs> I think you. Uh, how do you know that? <laughs> I made this movie once, and you were in it. <laughs> <laughs> Well, I, I think there's also, there's something else about stories that I was thinking of, which is you can tell people things that they don't want to hear in a story. So like if you take the Oedipus story, yeah, it's like the whole time, you know, when, when, when it would be performed as a play, everybody in the audience knew what the story was, that they, they, they knew the story. And so when Oedipus turns to go and confront Laertes, his father, Everybody in the audience is saying, don't do it, right? They're saying, don't do it. It's going to be big trouble. You know, don't yeah. confront the old man. And he does it anyway. And I think that it's a way that you can accept the thing that you really don't want to have happen. And so, so many of our stories and myths, you know, they, they're not Hollywood endings. Yeah. You know, uh, Prometheus is, is not a Hollywood ending. Yeah. Um, having his liver eaten every day by birds and have it grow back at night and then have the birds come back. I mean, that's, that's not a Hollywood ending. And yet, uh, <laughs> right? the Hollywood ending, he tames the bird. Anyway, um, but, but you can tell truths that people might not want to hear in a myth or a story. Yeah. And it's, and you, 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 if it's true, if it, if, it, if it resonates with truth, there's, there's an acceptance of it, even if you don't want that to be the way the story turned out. Right? Like, yeah. like the great love stories, the, the impossible love stories that yeah. Tristan and Isolde or Romeo and Juliet. or uh, you, you, That's not how you want the story to turn out. And yet there's some truth to the, that inevitability that on another level is, is deeply satisfying. You want an example of, um, there were two um, very um, popular uh, spiritual leaders and I brought them together. And one of them was um, one of them was uh, um, taking his own, his own self seriously. <laughs> and the other one said, you want to hear a story? And he told them the story of um, uh, the story of um, 
um, the guy who looks, looks in a river to see his... Oh, Narcissus? Narcissus. Narcissus. And the other guy couldn't... Uh, he says, yes, yes, very interesting, very interesting. <laughs> Yeah, you can get away a lot with a lot with a good story. Right? Yeah. It's, it, it's not you. It's not about you. It's about this Greek guy. Hmm. Well, I, I, I would I would I would say the, you know the um, the first time I ever met you was in the early seventies. I was on Martha's Vineyard and I was visiting a mutual friend of ours, Peter Simon, <clears throat> and he said, "Hey, you got to come hear this guy speak tonight. He's speaking at a local church." And I thought, you know, really, do I have to? And he said, no, 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 you really, you really come with me. And I am very critical of storytellers. If, if, if they're boring, if my mind is wandering to the past or the future and I'm making lists of things I have to do, I've, I've walked out on, on people, you know, giving boring lectures or, or whatever. And I found myself totally mesmerized by your stories. I was transfixed. And my mind didn't wander once during the three or three and a half hours that you talked that night. Three and a half hours. <laughs> yeah. This was in the 70s. You would, yeah. We were lucky. You know, you talked till the middle of the night at Wesleyan. Um, but um, uh, but I, my mind never wandered. And I thought, okay, this is, this, this, this is a very talented person. And I, they were funny. The stories were funny. They were self-effacing. You, you, you were talking about the ways that you had failed on your spiritual journey, yeah. you know, and, and you basically were embracing your humanity in a, in a way that was very funny and self-effacing. And it made me feel like, well, if he can, you know, be on the spiritual path and fall down the way I keep doing, you know, maybe there's some hope because also you would then go from the deeply personal to <clears throat> metaphysical realms and explain them in ways that I, I, I was understanding. So all of a sudden, I was understanding these concepts that I had read in you know books yeah. that I never quite got because they were linked to your personal journey. And you would go up and down uh, seamlessly. And um, and what was the other thing that was interesting was that the form and the content of the stories was the same because the content that night was that we are all divine and we are all human simultaneously. And that the art form is to hold both and dance between the tension of the two rather than going too far in one direction or the other. And if, if I may quote you, what you said was, you said, the, the problem is if you go too far into your humanity, you're going to suffer. As the Tibetan Buddhists tell us, life in an incarnation is suffering. You, you get old, you get sick, People around you die. You hold on to your tech stocks too long. You know, it's like all the things that make you suffer. And on the, on the other hand, if you go too far into your divinity, you said uh, you run the risk of forgetting your zip code and that that can sometimes become problematic. <laughs> and, so, and, and, and so that was the content of the stories, but it was also the form of the stories. And it was that night that I decided that whenever you were going to be speaking in a a place that I was, or if you were giving a workshop that I could get to, I would do it. And that was um, how we ended up here sitting next to each other today. And you've been following and following and following well, and following, to, my God. I'm still trying to understand it all, you know. <laughs> Some of the stories are obscure. I'm not sure I understand them completely. No, but I mean, I've heard your stories... A lot, you know. So am I. And you know what? I, I never get tired of them. It's it's like listening to a great aria. You know, I keep, I enjoy it every time, and I keep hearing new things that speak to my um, my emotional or spiritual reality of the moment. And it's like, oh, okay, now I get that. That now I understand. So. Yeah. You're as timeless as Oedipus. <laughs> In the, in the uh, time when I was visiting Maharaji the first time, I had come, 
I had come up in a Land Rover that um, belonged to a friend of mine, uh, and he had loaned me the Land Rover. And um, the Land Rover is an ex expensive uh, thing to be in India. And uh, the fellow I was with went up the hill to his guru. And I didn't believe in gurus. And I was a Buddhist and I wasn't, I didn't believe, I didn't believe in Hindus. I thought they, they calendar art and, <laughs> and, and, and I thought that the, the, the temples had too much, too much going on. And they had too many gods and goddesses. Oh, geez, I was. So this guy, he's, uh, he's going up to uh, he, his, see his guru, which was a Hindu guru. And I was w sitting in the car. And he was up, up, to, to, the, up to the guru. And I, um, there was a crowd around the car. And they were very um, um, friendly when he was here, there, because he spoke Hindi, and uh, he was running to, up to the guru. And the minute he left, the crowd was hostile, and they were. I didn't, lo I didn't feel uh, at all wonderful. And he said, and I said, uh, I'm going to stay here and guide the car. They were hostile because th they wanted me to run the, the, the guru. The, the guru was really there because he, he never there. And now he, what are you sitting in the car for? And he was really hostile. And uh, then um, I, finally my curiosity got the better of me of the, the guru thing. And, uh, and they're nudging me were, you know, and finally, I got out of the car and started up this hill. And I looked around, and uh, there's the Land Rover. And they're all standing around. And I am sure, I am sure, I'm sure they're, gonna, they're going to steal the Land Rover. And they only wanted me to get, go up. So, the, uh, so I go climb up. And then I come to a scene of um, Maharaj, this old man in a blanket on a, a, a tucket, a bed, and about 15, uh, 16 people or so sitting around him. And he's talking Hindi. And he points at me. Blah, 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 blah. And he's he and somebody translates for me. KK translates for me, and um, he says, "Did you come in a big car?" So, yes. And he says, well, "He points at me." And he says, the translated, will you give it to me? <laughs> Holy mackerel. I mean, I, I'm, you know, I've heard about these gurus, but to meet one of them, it's not my car. It's, you know, and this fellow 
with me. He stands up and he says, Maharaji, you can have it. And I am absolutely fit to be tied. I'm just, ah! And, and, so he said, Maharaji said, maybe, do you have, do you have money in America? I said, yeah. He says, you buy one like that for me? <laughs> and I am, uh, I, uh, he was just toying with me. He was so, so, because everybody in the circle was laughing at me. Now that is a teaching the teaching of my uh, um, attachment to the car, attachment to money, and the uh, attachment to the, uh, the, the stories I had about gurus. It turns out, by the way, I stayed there and the car stayed there and he got it anyway. <laughs> <laughs> but but also, by, you said that this was a great teaching for you, which it clearly was. It is. But at the same time, by your turning it into a story, it becomes a teaching for thousands of, and, and thousands of people who've heard the story who get the teaching as well because, yeah. because they identify with you through the story. And so and that, that's, that's one of the, the great teaching potentials of, of, a, of a great story. It, it becomes metaphoric for this bigger concept, yep. abstract concept about attachment or pre, you know, prejudgment or, or, or fear or whatever. Um, and, and so that, that anybody can learn from it. They don't have to go to India. Right? Yes. A any more than you have to actually kill your father and sleep with your mother to understand the, the meaning of, of, of the Oedipal story. Yeah. 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 See that the Land Rover story, it puts down me. It puts down my lack of spiritual nachas. So Hindu word. It's a Hindu word, yes. <laughs> I love that story. I love that story. Yeah. Because also he he was just sitting on this tuck and he looks up and he could sense that you were really uptight about the car. That it, you know, that it was gonna be stolen and your attachment to it and, and all that, he, he somehow picked up on all that. He somehow, <laughs> he somehow, he either somehow picked it up or else he made it happen. <laughs> he ma made my mind fix it. You know, I, I can't ever map his, 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 Reactions and things like that. Yeah. I I like um, humor in lectures, and I think. Mice. <laughs> <laughs> and I think uh, stories allow a lot of humor. A lot of humor. Ron, 
Artemis, why do you think, um, humor, why do you like humor in Rocky? What, what does it do? I like humor because in, in spiritual lectures, because um, they soften the audience. They make the heart much more soft. It makes them feel good in, in the... It puts you with the audience, not against the audience. And there's a, an intimacy, an intimacy. Did, did I tell you the other stuff? It's, it's, it's just humor and play. Yeah. And people just don't understand the humor is spiritual. There, 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 there are certain truths that you can convey when people are laughing. Yeah. That are maybe too hard to swallow if you just give it to them straight. Yeah, yeah. I think that anyone, all the great comics are people that have wonderful wisdom. Wonderful wisdom. Who are your favorites? Me. <laughs> <laughs> Good choice, yeah. I can't remember names. Oh. Should I say something? You nod if it's it, it, three guys. Three guys. The Marx Brothers. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Not including Zeppo. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah. No. The Marx Brothers could could tell confront social hypocrisy. Yeah. In a, be using humor in a way that would be a diatribe against the the ruling class if 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 it was just straight without humor. And and uh, I, I read somewhere recently that the trouble with Disney movies today for children is that they're all politically correct. You know, they're about some politically correct idea like equality of girls or equality of, you know, people who are different or whatever. But nowhere are kids being taught to challenge authority and, and to confront hypocrisy. Like the Marx Brothers did for yeah. their for their generation. That's that's true. Yeah. And what about Mark Twain? I know. I don't know. You know <laughs> yes, I, he's pretty funny. I, I, do, I know. He's he's very funny. I even one of his humor was I can't I don't know tell me a story <laughs> tell you a story about Mark Twain um, well I I think one of his great books is called Letters to Earth and he wrote it it was the story of Satan who is not banished forever, but banished for the weekend because God caught him doing an imitation of God. <laughs> and, and, and he was kind of making fun of God's like obsession with this creation that he was doing. And, and God got, you know, got, got angry at him. So he banished him for a weekend. But in heaven time, a weekend is a very long time on you know, earth time. So instead of just hanging out somewhere in the universe, he decides to come down to earth. 
and see what this what this big creation was. And he writes back these letters to Michael and Gabriel saying, you can't believe how incredibly dumb it is. That here. He says, <laughs> for instance, I'll give you one example. He says, <clears throat> of all the you know, millions of people that are on earth, how many of them have any kind of musical talent? He said, maybe 5%. And of those 5%, how many would you actually like to listen to? Maybe 5% of them. And how many people can sing? It's the same percentage. And um, he said, and what, what's the one thing that, that I've observed about hum, human beings is they like variety. They, they like variety. So what's their image of heaven? Everybody sitting around for eternity, sing, playing the harp and singing Hosanna, 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 over and over and over. <laughs> and he said, people are nuts. You know? <laughs> and and he, he, he pointed out all these great you know, foibles, of, especially with religion. And I always wanted to make it as a movie um, and thought that for public television, and there's no way that, that, you know, given some of their constituents, I would ever, ever get to make that movie. But it, it's one of his most brilliant books, actually. I've never heard of letters, that book. Letters, that one. letters from Earth. From, uh, By Mark Twain. Great. Yeah. Cher Harazad. Sarah uh, has uh, told a story every night. Every, for a thousand and one nights, right? Yeah. And I'm just trying to get through to my 80th birthday, mm. which is about, it's in April. Yeah. That is a monstrous thought. I'm 80, you know? I used to think of people 60, and they were, ah, jeez. They're old. They're old. They're old. Now you're looking, I'm like, oh, they're hot. <laughs> <laughs> now that's a story. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Okay, I'm going to tell the stories until, until... Until I'm a hundred. This podcast is brought to you by the Love Serve Remember Foundation and Ramdas.org. We appreciate you listening and we appreciate all the support that you've given us. Please continue that support and donate at Ramdas.org. We can then continue to share what Ramdas has been sharing for all of these years. Thank you.